Uh, thank everybody for attending. We're going to get started now, get the show on the road. Uh, for those of you that are new to Brooklyn Supply, this is your first time. Uh, welcome. We appreciate you being here. Those that are current clients, so we very much appreciate you coming in today. This is going to be an awesome training. I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Neil Heller, who came all the way from Southern California for this particular training today. Uh, he is the, you're the owner of Vigitron? Yeah, I'm one of the principal, one of the principal owners of Vigitron. Uh, so this is um, really valuable information coming right from uh, one of the leading sources of information from Vigitron. We're going to go over some, or he's going to go over some real powerful networking um, concepts. If you're feeling uh, perhaps deficient in your networking skills, you're in the right place to become knowledgeable today and be able to perform these skills out in the, uh, in the field. Uh, really, so no, with, with no further ado, let me again just say we appreciate you being here. We're scheduled to run till about noon. Uh, anybody that wants to stay afterwards, you're welcome to do so as well. Um, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Neil Heller and get the show on the road. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, for those of you who um, came in a little bit late, again, um, all these presentations, we're actually going to look at about two or three different areas here. Um, all these presentations will be made available to you, provided I know your email address, um, and it will be transferred to you. Like I said, um, these presentations are wordy. They're designed to be standalone. We're not going to sit here and I'm going to read every slide. Um, and what I'd really like to do is to hear your own experiences, you know. Um, just, there's, there's no like, you know, don't bother me, let's wait till Q&A, no, bring up, talk, let's, as things come up and as things that you want to share with the group, let's go ahead and do that, because everybody benefits from it. So, <clears throat> we'll get started. Uh, basically, again, for those who came late, I'm not trying to be advertorial, but Vigitron is a 24-year-old company. We've been in the transmission business starting out in analog. Since then, um, like I said, about eight years ago, we looked at the transition into IP and uh, said we better get into it. And uh, as a company, we developed our own types of technology. Now, networking has standards. They're all under IEEE standards. So anything we do conforms to those IEEE standards. But what we did was, we looked at the time, at that time, way back when in ancient history, eight years ago, as to what people were doing in terms of uh, transmission in IP. And they were using technologies based on VDSL. And VDSL types of technology, which was used a lot in cabling, had two significant drawbacks. And that is, as you went from one point to the other, the bandwidth started falling off. And the resistance started increasing, which meant that if you were transmitting bandwidth and PoE, that you had a fall off in bandwidth and PoE. And we just said that wasn't acceptable. And so we created two types of technologies. One is called symmetrical bandwidth. And these are all trademarks that we have. And what symmetrical bandwidth basically says is what I have on one end of the cable, I have on the other end. And we created something called pass-through PoE. And pass-through PoE says, at the point wherever the device is, we're not going to need any extra power. I mean, because that's what PoE is all about. And we decided, as an engineering company, that we needed to stick to reality. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. In networking, basically, we deal with three types of bandwidth. 10, 100, and 1G. And we deal with four types of PoE, four classes of PoE. Four of them are within called 802.3 AF, and then one that overrides that that came into vogue probably about four years ago is 802.3 AT. And the reason I bring this up, and we're going to get into more in depth about this, is because there's a tendency of products within the industry, and I'm not here to defame any competition, especially because I'm on record, but I'll do it in a professional manner. We have what we call lying truthful specifications. So if we're talking about extensions and somebody says, oh, you can go out 6,000 feet, the trouble is, can you go out 6,000 feet in a reality situation? In other words, if at 6,000 feet you have one watt and one mega BPS, 
yeah, you can go out 6,000 feet, but in our world, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, if I say you can go out 6,000 feet on coax, but by the way, what you have is RG59 in the wall, and you've got to rip it out and put in RG11, what's the point? Okay? So we decided just to stick to the real world specifications. Okay? And that is. Whenever you cut off lower than class two power, that's it. That's where your specification ends. And you tell people exactly what the performance is. Now, in doing that, we discovered something else, which, and this is where we start to get the segregation between data networks and networks that we need. We started looking at packet sizes. Now, in video, for those of you who remember analog video, we saw video because there were 30 pictures a second and it flowed across the screen, and we call that real-time video. Well, believe it or not, digital is not that much different. Only they're contained in what we call frames. And those frames have different sizes. And those are called packet sizes. The number of bytes within the frame is packets. Well, keep in mind that the lowliest one megapixel camera, which doesn't even exist anymore, requires about 1,024 bytes. It may surprise you that standard networking equipment is tested at 64 bytes. Why? Because we're dealing with Excel spreadsheets. We're dealing with Word documents. Now, there's actually a, a system called RFC 2544. You might want to write it down or read it, but it actually was the testing parameter set up for data networks, and it runs between 64 bytes and about 1,538 bytes. And above that, we have a process that you may have heard this term before called jumbo frames. Well, we started developing our equipment for 9,600 bytes, which at that time was considered to be the um, higher end of jumbo frames. Now some people consider it to be 10,000 bytes. So when I tell you that we have a certain specification, the best thing you can do is not believe it. Because we are required in our company to have certification testing for everything that we do. And we're the only manufacturer who has that certification testing. And it's one of the reasons we're so universally accepted. So we did all of this work. And for example, we tested for packets up and down, packets per second up and down, bandwidth up and down. And we developed our products, our, at that time, only our extension products. Because that's the only thing we had. It came out of the extension environment for UTP and coax. We developed them so that they would carry these packets and they would carry this POE as if it was a wire, as if we were just adding a piece of wire to the system. And what was very important there was something called latency. Because we're dealing with digital, two things come into effect. As you increase the number of packets per second, video frames per second, you increase the delay within the system. If any of you have ever seen or been subject to it where you have a PTZ and you move the joystick and you got to count to 20 before the camera moves and you lose the image, that's all called latency. So our latency only came out to 4.6 microseconds. So again, we created it to be a piece of wire. And we had a pizza party and we were very happy about it. And then we realized that we wouldn't exist except at that time for IP cameras. So, you know, who are we, you know, a nobody? We decided to find a small camera manufacturer and take our results to them and say, why don't you test the product with it? That small camera manufacturer, I don't know if you have access communications. Okay, I'm a little ones. And they looked at our performance and they said it was impossible. And we said, okay, you've got an engineering staff, go ahead and test it. And about three weeks later, we got a letter of certification. From them. And they came to us with a very interesting problem. And they said, we just released this new series of cameras called Q60s. They're 60-watt cameras. 
And we have a PSE, we're going to use these terms. In the 802.3 standard, the source of POE is called the PSE, power source equipment. And the product receiving the POE is called the PD, the product device, or the power device. And they said, we have this PSE, and it powers our 60 watt cameras, but it only goes out 328 feet, which is 100 meters, the limit of, of IP. And it's kind of hard to find an outlet in a parking lot. So, OK, we'll take care of it. Today, we carry their Q60 cameras. 1,200 feet without any power locally. And uh, at that point, we went out to every major camera manufacturer and we said, we will send you our products for testing, or you send us your highest bandwidth and your highest POE camera. And we were absolutely inundated. And if you go on our website today, You'll see it. You'll see all these partners, major manufacturers. And the reason being was all of these camera manufacturers at the time were getting an inordinate amount of returns for bad cameras. And nothing was wrong with it. And they check it out, they send it back to the client, it would fail again. So we started doing this inner operational testing. We found out something very, very interesting. We found out that the camera was surging larger than the amount of power that was being provided by the PSC. Now, the beauty about transmission is it's physics. It works or it doesn't work. It's not like if I put up a camera here and I said, or I said, is this tilted? You know, we'd have 20 or 30 different opinions. And they'd all be right. But in physics, it works or it doesn't work. Surging is a normal part of anything that's powered, even these lights. When I turn on these lights, it takes more power to turn on the lights than it does to maintain them, to be on. In the POE standard, and we're going to get into it and how it operates, when something like that happens and it exceeds the amount of power, it shuts down. Period. That's it. Over. You get one shot. And no specification, even today, deals with the, deals with the idea of surges. <clears throat> so we started looking into an area called mid-spans. And we said, let's develop a mid-span. A mid-span is a device that goes between, let's say, the network switch and the cameras. We'll keep using cameras because they're the best thing. And provides power. And let's develop these mid spans so it has every single feature in it to maintain operability. And that came up with the credence as to how we build a product. Number one, it's got to connect the first time reliably. It's got to maintain the connection. If the connection goes down, it has to automatically reconnect without having a service call. And number four, it's got to tell somebody something has happened. And we developed this whole line of mid spans to do all of that. First comment, though. If you're reading the specification of any POE device, and it only has one figure on it, let's say I need 7 watts to drive, add 20% to that. OK? Or else you're going to be subject to intermittent surging and shutdowns. If you read a spec sheet and it gives you a class of power, class 0, class 1, class 2, class 3, etc. Always provide your source to go to the maximum of that class. Case in point, a camera might read, I require 7 watts, but I'm class 3. Class 3 device requires a source of 15.4 watts and 12.9, uh, 15.4 and 12.95 watts at the camera. Even though it says, I only need 7 watts, your source better be 15.4. Because that's what, and we actually work with camera manufacturers on this, that's what's telling you, I don't know how it's going to react. I don't know what your cabling is. I don't know how much resistance there is in the line. Don't just say, OK, I'm doing my calculations, and all I need is a 7-watt source for this camera. It won't work. 
or it'll work so intimately you're going to get service calls. And keep in mind, once that transmission stops, it doesn't restart again, except of course for our products. Okay. So we had all the, we had all these great mid spans, and we took the mid spans out and we test them with actual people, you know, actual IT directors, and they loved it. At that time, we saw the merging between uh, IT and security. And they said, we love this product, and we're never going to use it. And we said, OK, why? Well, it's got an IP address. And I'm a Cisco person. You're not putting that. I'm not taking responsibility for that on my network. It's got an IP address. It could be hacked. So we actually removed, in a sense, removed the IP address, and we created an enterprise software system, which you don't need for operation. You need it to set it up. But once you embed it in the system, you can't get to it. You can't hack it. And we've literally sold thousands of these since they came into existence. Then we started getting calls from big camera manufacturers. And they said, you know, this is really funny. Now remember, during this time, the megapixel rate is increasing. We're going from 1 to 2 to 5 to 10 to 20 to 33. And they said, you know, Somebody plugs in a camera in a, in a switch and it's okay. Maybe it's an eight port switch and they plug in four cameras and it's fine. But when they load up the switch completely, they intermittently lose cameras. We can't figure it out. Well, we learned two things about network switches. And that is that in the case of the higher megapixel cameras, there's a problem. And that is, in any standard network switch, and this goes to Cisco's, to D-Links, to Netgear's, at 100 megabps, which is the output port of the camera, to the port of the switch, it only runs at 1518 bytes, or in some cases 1538, which again is within RFC 2544. Well, if you're in a 33 megapixel camera, you're in the jumbo frame environment. And you'll see the conditions. We'll talk about it and what happens. But there's something even more important. And that's called the switch fabric. The switch is its own internal network. And this is what allows you, when you plug in a camera on port 1, to plug your laptop into port 24 and see the camera. That connection internally in the switch is sometimes referred to as the switch fabric. And it's what connects all the buses. There's no standard for that in the industry. In order to resolve video, our video, on a network switch, the bandwidth of the switch fabric must be two times the sum of the total bandwidth of all the ports. And we'll discuss the problems that happens. And it is, and it's a, all of these. What I'm talking about is a cost factor. And obviously, costing is extremely important. But again, the beauty of it is it's black and white. It's not a question of cost. Sometimes the less expensive product is going to work. A lot of times it isn't going to work, and you're going to run into problems. And people don't take this into consideration, and so they blame the camera. The camera goes back to the camera manufacturer. Camera manufacturer says there's nothing wrong with the camera. They return it. The same condition is there. Obviously, the camera manufacturer is at fault. You know the story. Okay? Neil, can you just repeat that, how you have to double the uh, switch fabric so they can maybe write that down just in case they didn't get it? If you didn't hear it, mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the bandwidth of the switch fabric must be two times the sum of the total bandwidth of all the ports. If we're dealing with a 24 port 1 gig switch, it's 48 gigs. Just take the top bandwidth and double it. Must be. Okay, you mean throughput of the switch has to be over, I'm saying we're talking about the only thing you, you have up to on the 1 gig, right? On like 1 gigabit of throughput. So if you mm -hmm. put the cameras, you have to have Two gigabits, let's say if you put it. No, I'm telling you about the switch fabric, not the port. Yeah. The switch fabric. Within the actual path through between its internal mm -hmm. uh, 
design, whatever right. you call it, have to be in double or double. whatever you can do plug in. And yes. It has to be double. There's, uh, there's, another, uh, there's another consideration also. We talk about networking and we talk about it as if it was standards. We're going to discuss why it's anything but standards. And in the design of product, there are essentially six different manufacturers of what we call PD chips. The PD chip is what receives the PoE. They're all different. When manufacturers put them in circuits, they become different. When you install them, the type of transmission that you're using, the type of cabling, the length of the cabling, is all going to have an effect on it. So all of these things work together to change the performance characteristics of the product itself. So we, as the manufacturer or the leading manufacturer of transmissions, interfaces, we have to deal with all of this. But they're not all designed the same way. Basically, this is an outlay as far as what we view in towards transmission. And generally, everybody here deals with both sides of this, the recording and the storage device, what it goes into, or the connected site device. Okay? In the middle, you have all of these transmission factors. You have the wiring, you have the power sources, you have extenders if you're going to be using them. Etc. And all of these are going to affect the performance of the product itself. So you're not just limited to what the product is. Regardless of what the spec sheet says, it's going to perform differently within a networking environment. Like I said, I'm here. I have to remind myself every once in a while who I'm working for. But um, one of the characteristics of Vigitron that makes us different I already told you about certification testing. I told you about interoperative testing. None of these are done by anybody else. But we are the only manufacturer that provides complete networking solutions. And behind every one of these total categories of products is not just one product. It's a family of products. And that one consists of about our over 200 products that make up our products uh, category. And we release about 30 new products a year. Why is that important? Well, because many, many times you get a switch manufacturer, you'll get something else within the transmission environment, whether it's an extra power source or whether it's an extender, and you get the finger pointing. No, it's not my problem, it's their problem. No, it's not my problem, it's their problem. Because we have the ability of designing and providing complete network solutions, you have one throat to choke, and that's why the manufacturers like to come to us because it's one source that they can rely on of tested products. So we build product in every one of these categories and every one of these categories is a family of products, which also means we can provide the best solution for the sometimes three or four solutions and we'll tell you what that difference is. Like I said, all products are certified um, all products are subject to interoperative testing, and all the specifications are consistent. In other words, we don't put qualifications on you. Like, if you want to use this product, you've got to do this. No, we create the network, so we have to deal with those limitations, not you. All of our products are in single and multi-port designs. I just want to get through the advertising, and then we'll get on to the real stuff. They're all physical transmission. And we provide power up to 74 watts. It's a little bit dated because we're coming out with our 802.3 BT standard products now, which will be 95 watts. I, is, it's your standard, the AT and AF. It's actually your standard. No, it's IEEE. It's an IEEE standard. Uh, the standards now are that we use in our industry are 802.3 AF which is a source up to 15.4 watts. 802.3 AT, which is a source up to 30 watts. And we're going to cover this in detail. In between that is 60 watts, which is totally non-standard. 
So even though you have your Sony's, your Bosch's, your Hike Visions, your all of them requiring <laughs> some sort of pro, some sort of source greater than 30 watts, there's no standard for 60 watts. Mogu we'll that's how they do it. The committees now are working, and it's a long, arduous process. Um, the committees now are working on 802.3 BT, which is a 95 watt standard, but it's not finalized yet. And it's basically being done for LED lighting, LED lighting systems. OK, so what do we do as a company? Well, because we do what we do, our reputation's on the line. And when you're dealing with foreign governments, and you're dealing with airports, and you're dealing with gov big government projects, uh, stuff like that, uh, you got a lot on the line. So we do a couple of things. Number one, and this is probably the most important product we have, we have a design center service. Because we have all this documentation, we have all this information about how these products really work. And we have a team of engineers that will actually design a bill of materials for you specifically for your environment. Now networking and the environment that you go into networking is so unique, so individualistic, that don't let anybody fool you. You can do it with a computer program or a drop-down menu. I guarantee you it will be wrong. I absolutely guarantee you. This is why we pay people. We have actual engineers on site. And we will design that system for you. The service is free. There's no obligation. You don't have to buy from us. You don't have to do anything. It's totally free. On my card, the most important thing, you can go on the website and fill out a form, but on my card is support at Vigitron.com. I need help with the system. Somebody will contact you. You've got to answer very important technical questions like, what cameras are you using? What type of cable are you using? What's your power source, or do we need to supply it? And we do this for the convergence. We do it for the Stanleys. We do it for the RFIs. We do it for the Jason, for Johnson Controls. We do it for Tyco. We do it for all the major, major national accounts. And we do this worldwide. Um, and we look at the entire system. So even though we don't sell cameras, we don't sell recording devices, for example, if we see that the bandwidth going into an NVR or a server is too large for that server to handle, we're going to tell you that. And we're going to say, you need to create another leg in another server, because we don't want you to put in a network and then find out it doesn't work. So we try to protect your interests as much as we can on it. But I just it's, wanted to add uh, one, one thing, Neil. So in, in the package I gave you, there's a little bit more information on the design center. And what's important about what Neil is saying is when we do a design for you, we're going to give you options, maybe two or three, because it could be uh, space versus uh, in Iraq versus dollar for a budget. So we don't give you just one solution. We give you two or three to choose from that fits that application totally. So make sure you take a, a good look at this application or this document, I should say, because it becomes so important when you're designing a system to know that everything is going to work. So make sure you know that. The other reason why we do it is because of our warranty. Our warranty is the longest in the industry. It's production lifetime plus three years. Now, what does that mean? It means that even if a product goes out of production, we still warranty it for a full three-year period. And that's because we are the manufacturer. If you're OEMing, you, you can't do that. <laughs> okay. Now, we may have to replace it with another or a better product, but because of component changes, but we still honor that warranty. To show you what it means, we've had certain analog products today that are still operational 16 years. They're still under warranty. And they'll remain under warranty even when they go out of production for another three years. Nobody else does that. So we have to build product with quality. We have to build product that's completely tested on that. OK. So enough about the commercials. Any questions? You said that you have a focus throughout the world, certainly. Mm -hmm. So we, did, we had projects 
we do have projects out of the country, you'll we'll be able to support us? Yes. Well, we, we do. Okay. Yeah. We do now. So, uh, yeah, we have projects. Uh, we quote projects every single week all around the world. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that was in Turkey. I was interested when you said that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Turkey would be serviced out of VCA, out of Switzerland, and us. Right. Okay. So. Okay, so let's okay. talk about um, let's talk about the two key elements, bandwidth and power. Okay, <clears throat> both of those continuously increase. I mean, as I alluded to before, we started out with megapixels and a one megapixel camera. Today we're up to 33 megapixels, which, by the way, we're certified for. <clears throat> we started out with cameras that basically required three watts. And today we have cameras that require 60 watts and growing. So <clears throat> the two basic areas here. So let's, uh, let's talk about bandwidth. Bandwidth has three elements that we take into consideration. Two of them seem rather logical. The first one is going to be the picture size determined by the Kodak. OK? Uh, Basically today, what you're going to find is H.264, 265, or in the case of Access, probably what they call theirs, which is called Zipstream. But there are various cameras today that not only perform in that area, but also will take images on the deadly MJPEG. And the ratio of that, as you're going to see, is about 6 to 1. So <clears throat> the Kodak, how much we compress is a key element of that. The second consideration is the number of pictures per second. The more pictures per second, the higher bandwidth you need. Okay, You're shoving through more images per second, you need higher bandwidth. The third, um, the third element is something a lot of people don't take into consideration. Uh, how many of you use Google? Can I see by a show of hands? Yeah, OK. All right. Now, did you ever ask? yourself, when I ask a question on Google, how does it know how to get back to me? Okay? How does it find me and give me the answer? And that's contained in the network overheads. And basically, when you ask that question and the, and the question goes out, it's going out with your identification. It's going out with your IP address, your location, everything else, which automatically means everything you do on the network, everybody knows. I mean, there are no secrets on the network. That applies to our IP cameras also. Um, when IP first started, one of the first installations in the country was I, Queens or the Bronx, Jacoby Hospital. I don't know whether any of you heard of it or something. Anyway. So <clears throat> the cameras required one mega BPS. They installed 100 cameras. They couldn't find many of the cameras intermittently, and they couldn't figure out why. Well, I was part of a committee when IP cameras first came into e existence. A um, little bit of a background. I was actually a Japanese employee of Panasonic and Sanyo in Japan. Um, and I ran some of these divisions. So I was actually on a, on, a, on a group committee. And we were trying to determine the packet overhead. And we came up for IP cameras. And we came up with about 50%. So that means if I'm dealing with 100 megabps, my actual bandwidth transmission that I have available is only 50 megabps. If I'm dealing with 1G, my actual, for my uplink, my actual available bandwidth is 500 megabps. But you don't resolve, there are some manufacturers now that use a 55% overhead. So they've even gone lower. But the key point here is you don't have 100% of that bandwidth to deal with. So these are the three factors that determine your bandwidth transmission when you're trying to push the picture through. Uh, case in point, I was at an um, installation in um, Germany, and they had 700 cameras at a stadium. And two things were occurring. One, they were losing cameras. And second, on the PTZ cameras, whenever they moved it, 
they were getting this choppy movement. That's all band. Well, we went into the programming. It was with, it happened to be all access cameras. And we went into the programming of their system, and they had programmed all of their cameras for MJPEG. So you can imagine the bandwidth was enormous. It was, it was averaging about 8 megabps per camera. So you figure it out, 700 cameras times 8 megabps. And you can see, depending upon the movement of the cameras and the traffic in the cameras, why you had these problems come up. But whenever you see the total bandwidth, OK? So immediately, what I said to you was that if we have a, a switch and we have the output of the camera at 100 megabps, which means the port of the switch has to be synchronous at 100 megabps, whatever you're plugging into shouldn't be more than 50 megabps, which with a camera is an individual camera is really not a case. On H.264, 265, they average about 1.8 megabps. Call it 2 megabps. It's not a big deal. MJPEG, like I said, is going to be about 8 megabps. So you can figure out your input of your camera as far as what you're putting into it. I have a question. Mm -hmm. move on. Uh, when I'm looking at this, I'm breaking this down into seconds. Mm -hmm. right. So you have uh, basically the throughput. That's the What's being taken up by the connection from the switch to the camera? Yes. Have that piece. Then you have uh, your head end equipment, which is communicating with that same network switch. And then you have the client workstation using the GBMS, right? So these are different. These pieces. are all brilliant. Yes. Right? So uh, not give you a perfect example. I'm not sure if I'm looking for the actual answer here, but I just want to pose this, this statement. For example, if we're looking at high vision, mm -hmm. we know that they're high vision, 32 channel, 64 channel, commercial MVRs, not this, not their real server. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a processing limitation, mm -hmm. number one, right? They have gigabit network uh, NICs. They have gigabit right. NICs. That, that doesn't mean anything because their processing really sucks. So if you have a 64 channel, you're really not putting 64 channels uh, as far as uh, Three megapixel, four megapixel cameras are really not 100% getting that. Right? And then they have a limitation of 128 connections per MDR if you're using your PMS. So what winds up happening is that, um, let's say, the manufacturer for the MDR is trying to deal with their own limitations on their own hardware because they know that they're having a problem on the VMS side. And so what we as Systems integrators have to do is start dialing things down. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's our way of dealing with this. So I'm just looking at this picture, connecting the dots, and seeing how there are other ways that some of this can be overcome without compromising mm -hmm. the client side. The client actually, you know, the, uh, the the sock center or whatever when they're viewing this, if they choose, like I said, a high vision product. Otherwise, you will go to a server brand. Well, let me actually bring up some excellent points, so let me stay with it and translate that. Okay. We start out with the camera. The camera goes into the switch. I've already defined that the switch is its own basic network. Even though it's part of a network, it's its own basic network. Your point, which is very well taken, is when I take that signal out of the switch, and I go into, let's say, an NVR or a VMS system, which essentially is a computer. That's its own network. You have its own bandwidth limitations. The writing speed to the drive and the recovery speed is its own bandwidth limitation. And then you take that out and you go to a client which is on its other network which has its own bandwidth limitations. And uh, it's good to recognize because a lot of people don't. This is where when we walk somebody through troubleshooting, we actually have to walk them through each stages of it until they get to a point where we find out where the problem is. Mm -hmm. But there are actually, in a single network, there are actually multiple networks. And you have to deal with those bandwidth limitations in the multiple networks. And uh, you would be surprised how limited VMS, or especially NVR systems, are in terms of 
no, I, I, extremely limiting. Yeah, no, I, I know. But as I, I think I just thought it was important to bring that up because uh, we have to be thinking in those terms all the time, especially when we're doing large reforms. Well, let's go, let's go back to this because this is your point. Okay. Yeah. Life, as I try to tell my daughters, is compromise. <laughs> okay. So you don't listen, but it's compromise. What do you mean I can't have the wedding my sister had? Anyway, but for example, if I, you take a look at these three factors here. In fact, don't even look at this right now because this is a given. You can't change that, I can't change that. Let's look at the two factors <coughs> up here. Okay? Do I want higher resolution or do I want pictures per second? That's always the compromise, okay? Uh, no, I've got a high resolution, high pixel camera that's 33 megapixels, and I want that resolution. I'll give you even a better example 4K. 4K is such a fallacy, it isn't funny. Not that the cameras don't perform at 4K. Remember, I said camera manufacturers basically, we're, we're not talking about lying because there is no lying. But when you take a 4K, if you operated it at 4K, you're going to run into problems with the systems that we have, okay? Either in terms of the number of cameras that we're dealing with or the ability of recording those number of frames. So it usually comes down to this compromise over here. People don't like compromises. They, they're not told about these compromises up front because they look at the spec of the product. And that's what this whole thing is about, specifications. They look at the spec of the product and they take the specification of the product at their face value rather than incorporating it into a system and say, how is it going to act in the system? Is the system, not the product, going to perform to my needs? Okay, so again, this is, like I said, these are all standalone. You're, you're all going to get copies of it. Um, the jumbo frame environment. Okay. Again, like I said, we are certified with Access and uh, Vigilon at 33, at 29 megapixels, all certified tested. But a lot of people don't realize that a lot of these cameras require jumbo frames. Now, when you look at the, uh, at the specification of a switch, it's going to say, I handle jumbo frames. Everyone is going to say, I handle jumbo frames. But it handles it at 1G. In networking, you cannot run asynchronous speeds. If I take that output port of that camera at 100 megabps and I plug it into the port of a switch and it's running in the auto sensing mode, which 99% of switches do, it's going to resolve at 100. If I force that port into 1G, it's going to run asynchronous with the camera. I'm going to lose images. So I'm stuck. So this is the borderline. This is your beta networks. This is what we need to a large extent. And again, compression is going to be a factor here. So going back to this gentleman's comments, lower the number of images per second, change the compression ratio. They all will have factors on, on these. So how many think that POE is actually a standard. I mean, it's IEEE. It's got you know four letters in front of it. It's got to be a standard. It's actually not so much of a standard as you think it is. And to understand this, and we're going to get into uh, a little bit more of the operation of it so that you understand it. When I take a camera out of a box, an IP POE camera, it's essentially off. If I program a network switch or a mid-span that's compliant to the PoE standard, and I say I want that port to have 30 watts, if I then take a meter and measure that port, it's going to show me zero. That's because in the PoE standard, the way it works, until I take that camera and connect it with a cable to the port of the switch, making a complete circuit, nothing happens. And this is what happens. The moment I plug it in, the PSE, the port of the switch, issues what's called a detection pulse, which is nothing more than a voltage. Travels down that cable and it goes to the PD, the power device, which is in the camera, which is really nothing more than a resistor. But it is standard. It's 22 ohms 
or it's because cabling is a thousand feet, it's measured at 22 k ohms. And it goes across that, and the action of the voltage going across the resistance goes back to the PSE and says two things. I'm here, I'm valid, and I need this much power. If it doesn't happen within 40 milliseconds, or the request for power is greater than what can be given from the port of the switch, the process shuts down. And it doesn't start up again. It doesn't ask twice. Okay, it's it's gone. How oh, many sorry, the network of the PoE? The PoE. Same, but if the camera isn't on, you don't get transmission. Okay, because the camera doesn't have any power. So how many? I've seen switches where. Go ahead. Where it goes off, the network light is off, but the PoE light. I don't mean the part the camera's on, but I see the PoE light. The camera's plugged That's in. That's a very dangerous switch then, and it's not compliant. Okay. Uh, you said it, not me. I said I wasn't going to defame. Yeah, I said I wasn't going to defame. That's not compliant, and it could actually cause a problem. How many of you have actually had that situation, and you've taken it off the ca cable, plugged it back in, and the camera amazingly woke up? Okay, because you're regenerating the detection pulse. doesn't take away the problem. <coughs> the problem existed, but... There could be other factors as to why this doesn't occur within 40 milliseconds and it shuts down. In other words, the power could be fine, everything could be fine, it could just be something. But that's why the cameras don't power up. Well, here's, this, here's the problem here, okay? I want you to look at these columns. We should get out of your way, <clears throat> if you can see it. And you see that in every class, and we'll deal with 802.3 AF, which has four classes, class 0, 1, 2, and 3. Class 0 and class 3 being the highest, where the source is 15.4 watts. You can see that it has a range of voltages. Okay? When we get to 802.3 AT, which is over that and up to a source of 30 watts, the range of voltage for the detection pulse can be as much as 20 volts. Has anybody here seen a spec on a camera that tells you what the detection voltage is? No, it doesn't exist. Okay? And what did I tell you? There are six different manufacturers of PD chips. Everything changes when you're in a circuit. Okay? Manufacturers of equipment such as us, have free reign over that. In other words, anything that I say as a manufacturer over the, the lowest value, I'm legal. My spec is legal. It may not work, but I'm legal. Okay? Wait, it gets even worse. Take a look at the wattage, and we'll just deal with this. <clears throat> so in class two, the wattage that's supposed to reach the camera is 6.49 watts. That's class 2, 802.3 AF. If my system is capable of having a source of PoE that is capable of providing 7 watts, I can legally call that class 3. My camera may be 12.95 watts, but that doesn't matter. I'm still legal. It gets even worse when we get to AT, because AT only has one value, and that is 25.5 watts at the camera. But class 3 ends at 12.95 watts. Therefore, if I can provide 13 watts, I could call myself class 4. It won't work. Okay, and that's why I highlighted these two. So when we get calls and they say, but the spec says, I, I want to hang on this for a second. We go with a minimum of 42.5. Only for, by the way, AF. When we go to AT, we go to, we go to 56. We will not allow anything 
below 56. And that's basically uh, what almost all of our, our products have graduated up to that. But you see how confusing the, this is. Now, <clears throat> the other point has to do with the transmission. I don't know whether I have it. Well, we'll get to that. Let's make PoE even more confusing. OK, so the IEEE standards group introduced 802.3 AT, AF. And then people said, no, 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 we need more, more power, more power. So they developed a committee for 802.3 AT. I was actually an adjunct advisor on one of the committees. And they actually came up with four proposals. One of them, the first one, was the Cisco proposal. You know, Cisco, I'm Cisco, I rule the world, you do what I say. Um, and it was actually only for VoIP phones. So it, it was discounted, could never apply to our industry. Another one standard was immediately rejected. But by this time, people were growing impatient because this went on for many, many years. So they said, look, we're just going to come out with a 30 watt source. And I'll tell you why 30 watts is important. We'll get into that. And we're going to make it just like AF. We're going to issue one detection pulse. Then, because these committees are done by engineers, you've got to, you know, they're like, engineers and lawyers are the same. You know, you always got to do something better or cost more money. They came up with a second standard called Type 2. So this became Type 1, this became Type 2. And Type 2 says, when I issue my first detection pulse to say that I'm alive, once I do that, I got to issue a second one that says, I'm going to give you permission to send me more than 15.4 watts on the line. Now the standard says they're supposed to be compatible, backward compatible. Yeah, lots of luck. Um, a very well-known camera manufacturer, I'm not going to name names, brought out a series of 802.3 AT products. We started getting calls from their uh, field engineers, both in Europe and the United States. And um, they said, it's, it's not working. You know. People are plugging in various sources. Some of them work, some of them don't work. Would you please investigate? And like I said, we do a lot of pro bono work because it helps us design product. Well, we found out in this case it was type 2, but it wasn't backward compatible with type 1. Now, both of the specs on this source are going to say 802.3AT, but they're not always going to work. And we did all of these pictures, we filed all of these reports, we did everything, and basically the manufacturer told us to drop dead. And it's a big thing. You might also be surprised that different products made for different parts of the world operate differently in terms of POE as a result of it. So all of a sudden this standard is not so much of a standard. We have to deal with it universally, but you have to deal with it in terms of, of questioning. You know, you send the camera back, it comes back to you. You know, it, it, some, sometimes you'll see, you'll get two effects on this. Sometimes you'll see an, uh, an OSD, an on screen display, come up and say you don't have enough power, but the camera worked properly. Sometimes you'll see that the camera will transmit video, but you can't move the PTZ. We're going to get to that in a second. So any questions on the standard, non-standard POE? Um, when I'm thinking about this, uh, I do um, long range wireless for cameras as well. So I'm a Toyota manufacturer, I use proxy because mm -hmm. we send power directly uh, to um, the antennas mm -hmm. and then the antennas provide their own POE right. to the cameras. Proxim is a pretty good product. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I am seeing that there could be some compatibility issues, even though I haven't had any issues with Proxim, but if I had to use a lower standard device, 
Yeah, uh, basically now what you're saying is uh, uh, I have to be a little, there's no way for, for, for us to know. That's the problem. Right, what's going to actually. But you could know what the condition is. Right. See, the point of this is we can't change manufacturer specifications. But like I said, we have to build our product to take all of this into account. But what you could know is you could know the condition. See what I'm saying? And that makes it different. This is just a uh, representation of how the response works and what POE is. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. But. Does your support department also um, support if a person does need VoIP uh, services and, and uh, cater, cater to uh, specking out a, a VoIP system? Yeah, we do a lot of VoIP systems. In fact, I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but what, we're under a significant test now in VoIP systems because of latency. Okay. A lot of the, um, our latency, even in our network switches, is exceedingly low. In fact, it's been tested by by uh, a major audio performance company is having, and they published actually one of the companies that has praised us in public. And we're under a major test in Los Angeles in terms of latency comparisons uh, for VoIP systems. Anyway, so this is just, like I said, this is designed as a standalone on it. So this is just everything that has already gone over. So, <coughs> Let's talk about another fallacy. I love this one, okay? CAD5 cabling, CAD5, CAD5A, uh, E, CAD6, CAD6A, whatever you want. CAD cabling that we talk about is eight wires. We talk about it in terms of four pairs. In four pairs, the way the uh, POE standard reads, two pairs are called the A pair, two pairs are called the B pair. You can run POE or data on any of them. They're supposed to respond, but they have to correspond. So within the A pair, let's say, same thing for the B pair, two wires carry power, POE, two wires carry data. Okay? You can't carry POE on one B, on the B pair and data on the other. Okay, doesn't, it's fine. But there's a limitation here. This is 24 gauge wire. Wire is resistance. As you pass current through resistance, it gets hotter. So there's a limitation in terms of safety and heat. I was actually, I was born in Brooklyn, okay? Um, I'm proud of it, though, you know, proud of it. Your basketball team is another factor, not like my Warriors, but, you know, I'm proud of it. Um, don't want to go there. Um, but, um, the point is that my introduction in electronics, which they can't, they don't do anymore, was actually where you took a nine volt battery and you put a wire between the two terminals. I don't know if any of you experienced it, and you watched it get white hot until it broke apart. Okay, that was due to the current that ran through it. Or you call somebody over who you didn't like and say, just touch that, it's okay. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, these two wires have a current limitation. And the current limitation is approximately 7 amps, or 1.4, maximum 1.5 amps per pair. And when you're dealing with the upper end of the voltage, and this, this determines the amount of wattage, that's how you get to a limitation of 802.3 AT at 57 volts. Because 57 volts at that equals 37 watts. So your pair, your comparison comes through that on your A or your B pair, the maximum power you can put in is 37 watts. In the standard, they put it down to 30 watts because they wanted a lot of overhead. Now think about this for a second. I told you that the approximate surge value was 20%. So I can actually take that 30 watts and run it to 36 watts and be able to handle surges. That's what we do, okay? Uh, but there's another fallacy here. Coax cable, 
of which there are hundreds of thousands of installations still operating on coax, has to be converted to IP. We have two problems there. One problem is that it's coax, and the second problem is it's over 328 feet, 100 meters, the limitation. But the point is that coax is only two wires. It's a shield, and it's a center conductor. Be very cautious of anybody in our environment who says, oh, yeah, I can run 90 watts over that. Mm -mm. No. Get a fire extinguisher and hope you have your insurance liability paid up. 37 watts is your limitation. Now, how do I get 60 watt cameras? It's very easy. The manufacturers built two PDs into their cameras, 37 and 37, 74 watts. There's no standard for it. Every camera manufacturer does it differently. But now I got to act, if you remember on the detection pulses, now I have to turn on my detection pulses at the proper time to generate both PDs. This is how you get to the situation in these large PTZ cameras where you could have video transmission, but you can't operate your PTZ. So you need four wires for the 37 twice? You need, actually you need all four pairs because, four pairs. because two power, I can't, two data, okay? They're two, they're actually, the way the camera manufacturers generally did anything over 30 watts is 802.3 AT times 2. But the cat 5 e is like 24K. Usually the coaxes are 22. Some of them But it's only a single pair. Regardless of regardless. the... Regardless. It's, regardless it's only a single pair. One pair. So you... Go ahead. So you can't use the camera for... If you would have to use 60 watt camera, there's no way you could convert it from coax from my pito coax? Not, you have to do it on both sides and only run data through. You can't. But not a power, only not power. You're limited to 37 watts. If you have a PTZ that only requires 30, 37 watts, you're okay. But a 60 watt camera, no. Because you're, 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 we have a way of multiplexing, we have a way and competitors have a way of multiplexing the power and the data, but it's still only a single pair the PDs won't wake up. So the answer is no. So then, Anil, in that case, you would power the PTZ at the, at the camera. At the camera. And, yeah, we have, we have other equipment that will do that, mm -hmm. uh, specialized equipment. But uh, again, I'm not here to push the product, but we can do it. Uh, but anyway, here's an example of what I was talking about. Uh, the differences between coax, when we talk about an IP environment, and CAD cabling, okay? But what you should know is, as cable distance increases, resistance increases. In electronics, the maximum amount of power transfer occurs when the resistance of the source is matched to the resistance of the receiving device. Remember I told you that within the standard, the PD is essentially 22K ohms, okay? There's a range that it goes through above and below that for several factors. And when you're outside of that range, the PD does not wake up. So in actuality, your distance limitation or your ability to work is not so much power, but it's the voltage being received by the camera to turn it on becomes your most important factor. If the camera never wakes up, it doesn't matter how much power you have. Okay? That's important. If the camera never wakes up. So your cabling becomes a critical factor. Um, case in point, uh, we, had, we do a lot of gaming, a lot of gaming, especially Indian casino gaming. And there was an installation, it was 800 cameras on coax. The coax could not be pulled. No problem, we have the equipment for that. They installed about 600 cameras, worked perfectly. These happen to be class three cameras. 15.4 watts, 12.95 watts. 
200 cameras wouldn't work. You come to find out that um, in these 200 cameras, they had linked two ends of the coax in the middle with mini coax. So the resistance went way up. Okay. <coughs> mini coax. Oh, uh, mini coax. Okay. Now, they couldn't pull, the casino wouldn't allow a new cable to be pulled, and that wasn't the point. But this is how we had to design new features into our products to maintain the safety standards yet get around that, and we did. So we actually do a lot of design work on, this is another commercial though. We actually do a lot of design work based on what we find, and we solve their problem without having to pull the cable. But it's that resistance factor and the voltage that actually becomes critical, that factor that you never see in a spec sheet. Just a question on that. Mm -hmm. um, would you have had a device that could be put at the point where the regular quartz was going to the mini? If they needed to, yes. And do a conversion on that, just that short? Yeah, and just leave it with the data? Sure, we have, like I said, that's why we have over 200 products. But in this, going over all the products no, we're not going to be going over. It's boring. I don't want to subject you to that. I'm going to be going over the products at the end of the presentation. Oh, God. <laughs> Kill yourself now and get it over with, for God's sakes. I'm not even staying for that. Um, OK. This is, this is a little bit. Go ahead. One other question. You said the maximum. Uh, you made a statement that the maximum power transfer is where the two sides are what? Have the same resistance, or it's called impedance, OK? This is a little bit technical, but it's a good guideline. This is all the characteristics that determine acceptance or rejection, OK? So there's three major factors that will, with the PD, will say, I will accept that signal, and I'll go back in my 40 milliseconds and say that I'm here. And or if I'm below that, I will reject it. And this is a, when we do, we just, uh, we're in the middle right now of installing an 11,000 camera system. Not us, but, OK. It's a conversion coax system. $3 million sale, it was a nice one. but. They had to go out and they, it's government project, they had to establish the criteria for the cabling that was already done. We would not let them go through with the installation until they established the parameters of the cabling. So these are the parameters that they had to go out and test for to see that it was valid before they made the determination for their installation. Basically, now, here's another situation. <clears throat> when they established the 802 system, or the IP system, or how they got to 328 feet, which is really 290 feet, when you take the bend, what they call the bend resistance, into account, it was all established with CAD5 cabling. There's no such standard for coax. When we designed our products for coax, we designed it with the same criteria as CAD cabling. Why is that important? Coax can be anywhere from 7 ohms, which is fine, up to aluminum shielded cable, which thank God you only find here, <laughs> All right, or on the East Coast, which, guess what? It ain't going to work, period. It's not going to work. It, it, it's 100 ohms. It's not going to work. We don't even have a way around it. OK? So keep in mind that the standards were developed for CAD cabling. They were not developed for coax cabling. And coax has a wide variety of differences as far as internal resistance goes. Single pair cabling or alarm cabling is totally outside of the realm. We have equipment that works on it but within a very limited range. For example, CAD5, CAD3 cabling, telephone wiring, you know, it, it, you just get to the point where you can't <coughs> do anything. Don't be misled if people tell you you can, okay? Again, <clears throat> talking about the differences. There is also within CAD cabling different types. 
we talk about UTP, unshielded twisted pair. That's what the standard is made out of. There's also cabling called STP, which is shielded twisted pair. It's not an oil system, it's shielded twisted pair. But here's the difference. In STP cabling, the reason it's shielded is normally for outside usage. The shielding is unregulated. There's no standard for the shielding. Therefore, there's no standard for the resistance. See the difference? And when we go back to that other slide, which I'm not going to bore you and take you back, and you get into the capacitance and everything, that's all effective. You're not using the shielding to send the information. You're just using it, if I'm not mistaken. No, the, shield, the shielding is in the cabling itself for outside usage. It's in the dialect and it affects the capacitance within the cable. Yeah, but you're not, you're not using it to transmit. No, but it affects, it, it, the it difference does have an effect, effect on it, very definitely has an effect on it. Capacitance effect? The capacitance, which affects, again, the ability of transmission. So keep in mind that where UTP cabling is rather standardized, in terms of, if I say CAD5, CAD5E, CAD6, CAD6A, those things, which is what we use, is relatively is standardized. That shielded cable is not standardized as far as that goes. And it will affect, we actually do certification testing with cable manufacturers. And to date, we've only certified one cable, one cable manufacturer to be similar. So, um, but keep in mind, so if somebody says I'm doing an outside installation, well, wow, you got to use STP cable. Two things are going to happen. Number one, consider it to have much less resistant, much greater resistance, I should say. So an average thing is you might want to cut your distances in half. So whatever the parameters were, and we're not sure about this because there's no standard. If I said that this would operate at 1,000 feet, Probably, I'm going to say with STP, it'll work at 500 feet. That's just the safety margin. But we have no way of knowing. Because, again, it's not regulated. So you can't, reg if it's not regulated, you can't regulate the effect of it that it's going to have. What's the difference between coax and, and uh, UTP cable? UTP cable, keep in mind, remember I have those four pairs and I'm separating my data from my power. So it has a tremendous increase as far as its ability of handling power, but its bandwidth is limited. Coax has much greater resistance to power, but much greater bandwidth. If I eliminate, if I'm talking about 10 megabps, and if I'm dealing with, again, a standard H.264 at 2 megabps, I got enough bandwidth for that one run. If I eliminate the PoE factor here, I can go 5,000 feet. But if I'm dealing with the PoE factor, I have much less ability of handling power, which is also the reason why I can't handle anything more than 37 watts. So these are the basic differences between the two types of cable. When I'm dealing, and a lot of you probably run into installations where they're doing coax conversions. You know, they want to run IP and you want to save them a lot of money, you don't want to pull the coax, or maybe you can't because it involves asbestos or something along those lines. The other factor that's different is in UTP cabling, the cabling is twisted. Not like alarm cabling where we call it flat cable. That twisting eliminates a lot of noise on the line. And therefore, multiple, it can handle multiple signals, multiple different frequencies, where flat cabling can't, because it doesn't have the same rejection characteristics. However, there's another problem. Our video is 75 ohms. To keep the continuity within the line, remember, anytime I increase the resistance, I'm blocking that detection pulse, I'm blocking signal. So twisted pair is 100 ohm. So the systems that you're using for conversion must handle the differences between converting 75 ohms to operate on 100 ohms. 
Why is that a problem? There are certain manufacturers that in a certain country that's far, far away, it starts with C, okay, it's big, it has billions of people in it. It tries to sell us ZTE phones. I've been to the ZTE headquarters, it's amazing, but um, they don't do this. Okay? Yeah, you know, so somebody says, why is your product cost this much and their product costs this much? Okay? They don't take that into they don't take that into account. So how does their system work? Sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it doesn't. Or again, very, very short distances. Because you're dealing here with again resistance. It's all a matter of resistance. Um, little side story is a tangent. Like I said, we have over 800,000 channels that are operating in analog, and we have balance, okay? And our balance run about $15, $17 or something, and the Chinese balance run about $1.50. And uh, in the analog days, especially at the advent of DVRs, this is what would happen. One of the reasons is because the Chinese balance, what they did was they took two pieces of wire and they soldered it to a BNC connector. That was it. Didn't take into account. And the DVRs recognized video based on the horizontal sync. And the horizontal <laughs> sync is a very fast frequency transition. So as you would lose resistance, it would round off that waveform to the point where the DVR couldn't recognize it. Now, 200 feet, 100 feet didn't make much of a difference. 500 feet, 600 feet, it made a difference. And a lot of people couldn't understand why, you know, now I'm going to spend a dollar fifty versus fifteen, seventeen dollars, dollar fifty. And they would, they thought they would bring back the DVRs to the distributors and say the DVRs don't work. Very, sim very similar to what we're talking about here, but the same thing happens when we talk about Chinese knockoffs of this. Even though it's more serious, we're not going to get into it. But this is just the differences in resistance and, and waveforms. Like I said, you're getting a whole. The point here is that as your gauges go up, you can see that your resistance goes up. And that's the big point. So the difference is when we're dealing with single pair wiring and we're dealing with the transmission of PoE and video, gauges do make a difference between 18 gauge and 24 gauge. Now, you may say, looking at this, the logical question is, wait a minute, you just told us that Cat5 wiring Cat, again, I'll say Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6, Cat6. It's 24 gauge. Why can't I get more of a distance if we just drop it to 22 gauge? Well, the differences in resistance also causes a thermal factor that plays on the installation. So we work with several. Um, I told you in the beginning of this lecture that we work with Access very closely and we use them as our test bed for 60 watt cameras and we carry their 60 watt cameras 1200 feet. Well in reality at 5A, at CAD5, CAD5E, 5 CAD6, we carry it about 800 feet. But we work with several cable manufacturers who have developed specialized 22 gauge cabling that's CAD5E oriented that disperse the thermals within it to keep it within safety margins and allow you to carry it farther. So where we have specialized, we don't sell cable, but where we have specialized installations and certified and tested with us. Uh, we have a couple of clients who needed to take 60 watt cameras 1,200 feet, and that's how that came about. But that's why you just can't arbitrarily lower the gauge and put the same amount of power in it. This is one piece of wire, no intermediary devices or uh, 
No, just, just one piece of one piece of. Oh no no no! You, we, this is our extenders. You have always extenders. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, and in fact, <laughs> okay. You, you you guys are great. You bring up great points. There's several <laughs> switch manufacturers. Again, we're not going to mention names, who say, "Oh, my switch can carry PoE and data." 200 meters and you don't need extenders. Guess what? So can ours. But are you getting consistent bandwidth or consistent? In other words, they're not telling you how much PoE you're getting. They're not telling you what bandwidth you're getting. You go back to those line two specifications. Our switch, by the way, our switch is, we can carry it 300 meters. Probably won't work. But you're going to get PoE and data out at 300. You see what I'm saying? It's the same thing here. And that's why we stick all in these standards. <clears throat> this chart is, is, is similar here. But what we did was we basically took our products and we put them in the range of, um, of power out of, of certain applications and what sort of classes of power you get out. Again, I'm going to run through this. We, um, this is the specialized cable, and the difference you'll see here is, with the 70, is in the 74 watt range. Over here, you see that the maximum is 800 feet, whereas if I go down to 22 gauge, but again, not just any 22 gauge, you can see that it increases it to 1,200 feet. But this is, again, we're an engineering company. So we work with other manufacturers in engineering. Cat5 cabling can go up to 1G. It uses the two pairs, the two pairs of wiring. It can use both A and B pairs to handle up to 74 watts. And we can transmit video and PoE up to about 3,000 feet. Single pair wiring, your bandwidth drops to 10 megabps. It's limited only to 37 watts, and the limitation is about 700, 1,700 feet. Again, this is going to depend on the specifics of your application, but these are the top end limitations. Any questions so far about any? Are, are you getting? Is this worth it? Are you getting guys? Getting yes. guys? Is it okay? Because if it's not, you know, throw something at me or something. Um, okay, fiber. Fiber is, you want to talk about confusion, fiber is confusion. Um, and yet, it's rather simplified. Fiber, you have to know what the fiber is. Is it single mode or is it multi-mode? Couple of parameters here, <clears throat> and we're talking in generalizations. Single mode, I'm sorry, multi-mode in older installations is 62.5 microns, newer installations, 50. What are the differences? 62.5 runs out at about 1,000 feet. OK, that's your limitation there. 50 runs out at about 1,500 feet. Above that, above 1,500 feet, if you're doing an installation, you got to go single mode. Now, if you're already into an installation that has fiber, all you got to do is know what the fiber is. But if you're doing a new installation over 1,500 feet, go single mode, which is about 9, 9 slash 125. When you do fiber, the elements in almost everything now is SFPs, has to be matched on both ends of the fibers. Whatever is here has to be here. Has to be the same type. You cannot mix modes. You can't put a single mode on one end and a multi mode on the other end. You can't do that. We talked about the lack of standards. Well, guess what? In SFPs, there's only one standard. It's called the MSA standard, the multi source agreement standard. And that multi source agreement only dictates one thing it says, I can take an SFP. And I can plug it into the port of a switch if it has an SFP compliant port. Uh -huh. That's it. There are no other standards in SFPs. No other standards whatsoever. 
So I just told you that the two SFPs on either side of the cable have to be compatible. And I also told you that they have to match the cable. So you do that because you're smart and it doesn't work. Well, guess what? There's no standard for a switch recognizing the SFP. Does that exist? Cisco says, I have Cisco switches. You've got to use our Cisco SFPs. They're only protecting themselves. OK? Because there are no standards. We get lots of calls that say, I have the same SFP on each end of the cable. I have the right SFPs for my fiber. It's not working. There's nothing that is compatible that says that if I'm running the switch in an auto mode and I have an SFP there that let's say is 1G, that it's going to recognize it's 1G. Nothing. What's the fix? Well, you may have to go in and program the bandwidth of that switch to be fixed and not run it on the auto mode. That may not even work. In our enterprise level switches, we actually have separate modes for programming SFP compatibility. That's how screwed up it is. There's another factor of SFPs called DDMI, which is Digital Display Media Information. DDMI is what tells the switch, and it's, it's an option in SFPs, is what tells the switch that I have an SFP, here's your temperature, here's your frequency, it reads out a whole bunch of great information. Absolutely no standards for that. So you could have an SFP with a DDMI, you could have a switch that's capable of reading DDMI information, and it doesn't work. And because there are thousands of manufacturers of SFPs, we don't make our own SFPs. We program our own SFPs, but we don't build them. They can be all over the, the place. So don't assume with SFPs. And if you plug in an SFP, again, I'll say this because it's so important. It has to be matched to the cable. It has to be the same SFP on both ends of the cable. Do not exceed, if you're doing a new installation, do not exceed the performance distances. Again, if you're installing 62.5, if anybody still installs 62.5, it's 1,000 feet. 50 is 1,500 feet. Over that, you go single mode. What's the limitation of single mode? Could be up to 80 kilometers. That depends on the individual single mode itself. But you can go up to 80 kilometers easily. Ours, I think, go up to 20 kilometers. And the SFP must be compatible with the bandwidth of the port of the switch. Now, normally that's not going to be an issue, but if you have a cheap switch that is limited in its bandwidth in a port, Let's say if you're working on 100 megabps, don't think it's going to recognize a cheaper SFP that only works at 1G. It'll never work. Okay? SFPs, better SFPs, could, depending on the SFP, have automatic sensing of bandwidth too and make the adjustment to match the switch. Again, it's case by case basis. So we get calls like that all the time. So let's talk about some of these things and considerations in terms of network switching. Again, I'd like to stop here. Are there any questions so far? Just to know in case somebody has to put money in the meter. <laughs> OK. Meter, what are those? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is everybody still okay? Is it okay to go on? Yeah, I mean, I'm here for you, so you got to direct me. Okay. <laughs> Let's. Is the 
I have a problem. I have a 10, 10 gigabit network uh, switches that compare to SFP plus, right? And I'm plugging them into SFP, right? I I know I could use SFP to SFP, but is the fact that that's the switch is running at 10 G, 10 G, right? Okay. There would be a limit. Is there would be cross no, 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 no. incompatibility because yes. one is doing right. 10, one is doing one, yes. even though both are running as a B? Yes. And that depends strictly on the switch. On the hardware. Yeah. There's no, I, I can't give you a solution. Mm -hmm. If I had this manufacturer, I can't. Okay. I, for ours, I can, but I can't give it for anybody else's. And that's why we developed these special modes in our enterprise level switch. And if you still want to hang around, we'll get into more detail on that. But let's talk about the real crime of specifications, or it's called network switching, okay? We already spoke about some of it in terms of the jumbo frame lie, and that is my switch does jumbo frames, but only at 1G. What does that mean to me? Well, if you're plugging in a camera or an access control unit, probably very little because it's gonna go out at 100 megabps. So you're gonna be fixed between 1518 and 1538 bytes. What's the reaction on that? And, and this is, again, keep in mind that what I'm telling you here is under raw compression. So your compression ratio is going to have an effect on this and could have a positive effect. There are two effects on this. Resolution loss or a mosaic pattern. And generally, you won't see this until you're in the higher level pixel areas, your 20 pixel to 33 megapixel cameras generally will not manifest itself because at that point the compression ratio of the camera will basically deal with it. But this is a problem that you get into. Obviously the camera's bad, return the camera. It's not the camera. This is your number one factor. This is the number one problem. I saw a camera five an hour ago, I can't find it. I saw pictures that I recorded from camera seven yesterday. They looked like there was a 10 minute space where I didn't record camera seven. What's going on? Let's, let's stick with this for a second. <clears throat> Let's define, let's, let's see if we can define how important switch fabrics are. And they are, they're very critical. Picture going down, I gotta I got admit I'm not really used to New York traffic. Um, but in LA, you're cruising along at 65 miles an hour and you're absolutely fine. And all of a sudden, a bunch of car cars come up and you're slowing down and you're at 35 miles an hour and then you're at a traffic jam and, and your exit is about a mile up, but you can't get off because you're absolutely stuck. Thank you, you can join us too, you know. You gotta, it's one of your own that always causes the problem. <laughs> so anyway, um, let's equate what I just said to the switch fabric. The switch fabric is handling all the cameras. It's your highway. There's light traffic or, or virtually no traffic. That camera just cruises along. It goes from port one, let's say your output or your uplink port is port 24 or 26. It cruises along to port 24, 26. By the way, all of our switches are 26 ports. Uh, goes out and it's fine. Okay, now you're loading up that camera, that switch, and you have 12 out of 24 ports. You've got more traffic there. Now you have all 24 ports loaded up. Now keep in mind that the cameras that are connected here are just connected. If the output of this, I should say the uplink to be technically correct, the uplink of this is to a DV, uh, NVR or, M, or a VMS system, that camera is only being called upon by that. Now, how many times it's being called upon is a matter of the program. 
But otherwise, that camera is just staying here. It's not going anywhere. OK? Until the VMS system over here calls it and says, come, I got to see. Somebody wants to see the camera, or somebody wants to record it. And that's why you get your intermittency. Because sometimes it'll be called, and the traffic will be able to come through. And sometimes it'll be called, and the car won't be able to get off at the exit. That's how important the switch traffic is. And that is the number one problem we run into. And I can't tell you how many camera manufacturers will call us up who have been through courses like this or whatever, and they'll say, I know what the problem is. Get your switch in there. And because all of our switches will not go less than that 2x time, that solves the problem. It really is a functionality of your lower cost switches. Notice I didn't say cheap switches. I said lower cost switches. But you generally will not really know about the performance of your switch fabric. You may have indications of it, but again, there's no standard that says I got to tell you the standards. Is there a way to test it in advance? No. Yeah, actual installation. But then yeah, before you before no. you actually put the product on the line. No, it's just realize bench testing, you know. What bench testing? Well, yeah, if you load it all up, sure. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And you know, in higher end installations, they will do that. But I'm saying you don't have to be concerned about our products. But understand, you get what you pay for. So when we were talking about either pixel handling or we're talking about switch fabric, it's a matter of cost. Okay? There's a reason why certain switches cost $200 and other switches cost three or four times more. Those are two of the reasons. Now, in our world, we don't want you rolling the trucks afterwards. Our concern is for your profitability and our reputation. All right, it's our reputation and your profitability. Thank you. But the point of the matter is, we don't want you rolling the trucks. And that's what we put into the design of these. The other fallacy about switches is layering. You ever hear of a layer two, layer three, layer four? whatever. Uh, hate to burst the bubble, but layering has no definition when it comes to network switches. Layering is an internet term. Who here ever heard of layer 2 plus? It's a made up term. Okay, Yeah, we have switches that are layer 2 plus. It's a made up term. There's no standard standardizations in the switching world that defines layering. Now, I'll give you a generalization, though, which will sound contradictory. Layers, go ahead. What does it mean? Routing should never be used for security. I'm going to, I'm going to explain that right now, OK? <coughs> Let's go back to Googling. Remember I said that you ask a question, and it knows who you are and answers back to you? That has to do with routing. Routing means that your question goes throughout the world, and it goes through various subnets, and they get back to you, OK? In general, and again, there's no standard for this, layer three has come to mean a term that includes what's called dynamic routing. And dynamic routing means that that switch can accept any signal coming in from any place. Now, normally, in networking, you have an address and you have a subnet. And you can get 254 devices on that subnet. But if you're not part of that subnet, nothing happens. With dynamic routing, anything comes in. Um, one of the things I've worked on for over 10 years has been switches and switch programming. And for security, I will never allow dynamic routing in a network switch because I can hack it. So I have to laugh when somebody says, I want a layer three switch. Well, why do you want a layer three switch over a layer two? Three is better than two. I've heard this. Now, we live in a security world. 
We're going to get into this in a little bit more depth. We live in a security world. Security means security. I don't want my security system hacked. I'm not going to allow anything to come in that back door. And if I have a switch with the dynamic routing, I'm letting everybody in coming in through that back door. Okay? Layer 2 plus has come to mean a lot of the features that are thrown into layer 3 except for dynamic routing. But again, no standard. So even though you read a switch and it says layering, it has no meaning. Is there a way to verify that there is dynamic routing or not? You got to look in depth in the specifications. Uh, this is just, a, a, again, a different chart showing the different bandwidths concerned in, sort, in terms of compression. This, we, this next slide exemplifies a lot of phone calls that we get. Uh, and we get referred a lot of phone calls basically from manufacturers who have nothing to do with our product. They just give up and they say call us. So let's say it involves our product. Okay, our extenders. And they get called, we get a call and they say, um, your product doesn't work, the camera's not powering up. Okay, how much power do you have at the port? I've got 30 watts. Well, how do you know you have 30 watts? The spec says I have 30 watts at the port. Okay. Important, because what I'm going to say now is, is important. Well, everything I say is important, but I don't want to when you look at the spec of a switch, especially cheaper switches, you have one power level. That power level defines the power of the switch. The PoE budget is a separate entity. You cannot run the PoE budget to the power level of the switch without it getting very hot. The hotter it gets, the efficiency goes down. But there's another factor. You're dealing with something in a 1U chassis. There are actually switches, I'm not going to name names, because they're not designed to run at 100% of their power level that are caught on fire. And dealers that have been slapped with liability suits. Of which the manufacturers don't back them. There must be, and I'm telling you this for your own good, if you see a switch that does not define the POE budget, or if the POE budget is less than 20 to 25 percent of the total budget, do not use that switch if you're going to have POE cameras on all your ports. Could you please repeat that last statement? Yes. Let me see if I can remember it. I'll, I'll say the words, but I don't know what they mean. Okay. <laughs> Example. Let's say I have a hypothetical switch. It says. It only has one power specification, 100 watts. It's not defining the POE budget. If, I, if my cameras that I'm plugging in there go up to 100 watts collectively, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to be running that power supply at its maximum. A, I'm not going to have any power left over for the switch, but I'm going to be creating a, a convection of it in there. And at the least worst case, I'm going to be shortening the life of the switch. At the worst case, it's going to catch on fire, or it's going to die within, let's say, a couple of months. They don't make breakers for them, just for no. collection? No, because what you're doing is, it's not a short. You're just draining the power to the maximum. So what we came up with, and not just us, I'll show you something else. What we came up with is that we averaged out the differences between the safety, between the total power and the POE budget. That comes out to about 25%. So when I'm looking at that spec, I'm saying my POE budget is only 70, is only 75 watts. Do you take 75% of what it says? Yeah, or 25% buffer. Now, so but this is this is the funny part or the sad part. So we tell the we tell the person to do that, okay? And they, they do the math, and then we say now divide the number of ports into that resulting figure, and all of a sudden the line goes dead. 
Remember, they only looked at a spec that said the port can handle 30 watts. They didn't say you had 30 watts when all the ports were used. So let's look at this actual spec from an actual manufacturer, not us. Okay? It says in this case that the ports provided full 15.4 watts. Okay. That means that I've got a 24 port switch and I can get class three on all. The wording indicates that all the ports are capable of 15.4 watts, but doesn't state that all the ports provide 15.4 watts at the same time. When you take the budget into account and then you divide it and you look closer, if I need to run all my ports at the same time, I only have class two, 6.49 watts. Shouldn't it be standard that you run, when you design a system, no matter what it is, electrically, I'm talking NC, whatever, you should have a derating factor. So you should never design something above your 80% mark, That's which is what I do. Shouldn't that be the standard across the board? What should be and what is is totally different. There are no standards for this. That's what, I'm, that's what this course, that's why you're here today. But we get phone calls all the time because people misread the specs. Now again, this is not a lie. You, in your own mind, applied that 15.4 to all, this, all the ports at the same time. So common. This is so common in PoE switches. And then as you plug in more and more cameras, they don't work. Well, obviously, if, and, and that's another thing. PoE handling in network switches is not standard. Some switches, okay, do a priority starting with port one. So they give always the maximum power to port one and always the least amount of power to the highest number port. Some port switches share power. So as you plug in the ports, the power level drops. So I plugged in, I have an eight port switch, I plugged in four cameras, they all work. I plugged in my fifth camera, they all die. Okay, that's called power sharing. A third way is you can fix program, and this is for better switches, you can program a fixed value of PoE into the switch itself. No standard in the industry. No standard throughout any manufacturer. What is the minimum power that a camera will work on? Which camera? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you go about figuring out what to program? Well, you look at the you look at the camera model. You look at the power that it requires at the camera. You take into account the surge factor of twenty percent. It, but it's my God, how many thousands of different cameras are out there? They range from class one to class to sixty watts. Um, does the Power specification on your switches. Well, is the power specification on your switches why you only use 26 ports on your switch? Why you don't go to 48? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay. Good. Uh, at, we get that question all the time. That's exactly right. Remember that our war well, warranty, lifetime plus three years, which by the way, no other switch manufacturer offers. Uh, we feel that we can't provide the amount of power that's required for common. IP cameras if we went to 48 watts, uh, 48 ports safely. So we will not go to 48 ports. And I had that design to you. Um, but I'm, I'm noticing that in the industry, people are starting to use 24 ports more often. And when I ask different people about it, they all give me different answers. It, it's, it's the power that's required. I mean, first of all, we, in the, in the same way we design a certain standards, we will not mislead you on the amount of port power. Okay, now ours are all programmable. We're at the higher level. But for example, on one of our switch lines, we, we say 36 watts per port. It's 36 watts on every port at the same time. When we say 15.4 watts, it's 15.4 watts on every port at the same time. And we won't go away from that. So because of that, that limits us as far as the, as far as the number of ports.
Now, in our mid spans, we go up to 600 watts, but they're only 16 ports. So where we had to go higher, we did a port limitation to say, stay within that safety range. So this is what I, uh, this is an example, and by the way, it's one of the few times when I'll praise Cisco. Uh, but this shows you how we get to the 75 watts. Because keep in mind also, your power utilization goes down as the power increases. So it's a matter not only of safety, and I'm not kidding you when I said beer of a deal is subject to fires, but it's also a matter of utilization. But that's how we determine 75%. So to sum up, we get our McDonald's. I, I always have trouble showing this right before lunch. But, um, we have uh, advertisement actual, OK? My product goes out to 6,000 feet, but there's no specification for the resulting bandwidth or power. My POE source is class 3. Yeah, but is it actually putting out anything over 6.49 watts? Or is it putting out the full class 3 power that's required? My switch handles jumbo frames. But yes, does it only handle jumbo frames in 1G? These are all the things that can mislead you. And they all will affect your performance. Some of our competitors, I'm not going to name names here, have these complicated like, uh, yeah, if you're going out this distance, uh, our power falls off this much, our power falls off that much. When you go to the good book, <clears throat> you'll see a mini um, design service. And you'll notice that these lines don't fall off, they're flat. So this is what can get you into trouble as far as misleading specifications. And other you can do this, but here are five qualifications. We don't want you to have any qualifications. <clears throat> this is our generalization as far as distances go. By the way, on cabling, your limitation on 100 megabps is 2,000 feet. That's physics. Okay? So if somebody says, I can go out at 100 megabps, 5,000 feet, uh, no. Doesn't work that way. Not us or anybody else. You want to do your own design center, even though we have a staff of engineers that will do it, that have all the information. These are the questions you deal with. So let's take a second and go over it, because it's these are the things that you should take into consideration for every IP system you're doing. First, keep in mind that every system is individualized. There is no cookie cutter approach. I'm sorry. It just Do a cookie cutter approach, you're going to get into trouble. This could be cameras, this could be access control, this could be wireless. And by the way, we, we were just assigned as the go-to for Sigler wireless, which is one of the biggest in the industry. We're going to be their networking source. So this could be any device here. What's the manufacturer and the model number? Because you have to have some guidelines. The guidelines are your specifications. What's the number of cameras that are routed to any one location? If you're dealing with an IDF and an MDF point, just deal, break it up into your individual IDFs. That's what you're concerned about. That's where your first routing or your first your first station is. So do it by that. Sometimes it's good to segregate into like site A, B, C, and D and look at them all individually. Distribution of frames. If different cameras are going to different locations, you need to know each one. Because each one is different. They require different power, they have different bandwidth, whatever. So you've got to then go and segregate in your individual site what your cameras are from the different manufacturers. What is the type of cable? Okay? What is the physical type of cable? It's obvious. What is the cable length? You will never go wrong. Let's let's say we have this one site A now. Okay? Happens to be 10 switches in this system. 
There are 10 IDFs going to MDF. Okay, my first one is site A. I'm only dealing with site A. Okay, break up your cameras into the number of cameras below or at 290 feet and the number of cameras above 290 feet. That will dictate where you need extensions. Why 290 feet? It's very simple, and this is relatively standard. Even though the Ethernet standard is 100 meters, 328 feet, we have what we call the bend element on each side of the cable. And the bend element adds a resistance. So at 290 feet, you've compensated for that. So that's what we do. We do 290 feet. So break it up, okay? For these three cameras, I need extenders. These three cameras, I don't need extenders. When you go to your extenders, always calculate on the longest cable distance, and you'll never go wrong. And then what is your PoE source? By manufacturer model number, which again will tell you the amount of power and how much power you need, okay? Does your PoE source, Basic, basic problem. I just dealt with this in a big system I did on Saturday. You know you, these NVRs that have PoE power? Forget about it, okay? Unless you're using the specific camera that's assigned with the NVR at 290 feet, it ain't going to work, okay? So your PoE source becomes very important. It's got to match the application. Okay? Um, let me tell you how important this is, but I'm not going to name names. There is a huge, huge installation that we're doing now. It's a two-year project. It's a company you all know. A lot of these were under NDAs, so I can't mention names. But I will mention the switch manufacturer, because it's all true. So this company with many locations throughout the United States and Canada decided they're going to take their security systems from analog to IP. Went to the IT department, and the IT department said, we're Cisco. We're going to use Cisco switches. Fine, who cares? They contracted through a major installation company and then contracted through a major camera manufacturer for the cut. So everything was all set. They did about 10 installations and the cameras started falling offline. They would just remember, when they shut down, they don't wake up again. It, it, except our products do that. Remember Vigitron? Okay, just want to see if you want to try. Um, <clears throat> so Cisco said, send us the cameras. Manufacturer sent the cameras. Now remember, Cisco is Cisco. Came back with this report with pictures and arrows and everything else and said the cameras are out of compliance. Now remember what I said about two and a half hours ago. Six different manufacturers of PD chips, okay? Differences in everything. We have to account for everything. Cisco accounted for this. Camera manufacturer, major name, said, you got to be kidding me. If we're out of compliance, every single POE camera is out of compliance. 1,300 Cisco switches. These are the differences that we have. This is why we spend $100,000. Believe me, I know lots of places the $100,000 could go that we spend on average every year testing other manufacturers' products. And I mean to my employees, not to me. Mm -hmm. um, but this is why we do what we do. And this is the result of that, and why we get those jobs. It's not easy. Don't think of it as being standards, because you can throw those out the window. I'm sorry, you had a question. So just give me a yes, you said give me experiences. Of what yeah, please. <laughs> So I was president of American Security at the time mm -hmm. uh, in Atlanta City. And we were contracted to do malls. And uh, we actually did a lot of work, I can't say where, but we did a lot of work in Washington, D.C. So pretty much very large camera systems. Right? And to tell you how important the switch is, we did a mall in the Bronx. I think some of you may even know it because the carriage was falling over the side. 
Pebble. And we started with, it was a good project, I think we did okay. Uh, but it was a five link went around mm -hmm. and came in and out, which I wasn't happy about. But their IT wanted it. We said yes to it. I'd rather have the fiber not going in and out. And, the, and they started dropping out the cars. Right? It was like they yelled at me. So I was there about five times. Right? Eventually, we found out that it was the switches. Yeah. Not the switches. And actually, the switches, I can't remember where they were. If I could, I'd tell you, but I can't. Right? Uh, but they were, they were pretty well done product. And I'm telling you what we went through. Four switches went bad. Not at the same time, of course. <laughs> they all went bad. And then on top of it, which insult to injury, we had a problem with, I'm not going to say the product, the MDR. So I actually hired somebody from MBFA, you know, the association at the time I was president, I think he was right. And he bailed me, us out because what he did is he put a scope on it and figured out what was going on. But we kept blaming the switches because the switches, but it turned out that we were getting freezing. So how important it is to use the right switch. I'm telling you, we lost so much money. I, I just, but you, know? you see, and yeah. that's our thing. This is why we have the design center. This is why, in fact, in some cases, larger cases, we even now have added a configuration service. Now, we can only do it if we provide the switch and, and the, but we, besides QCing the products, which we do, obviously, we will actually put together a whole system to your specifications and QC it as a whole system. So we actually had to hire somebody because we didn't have the expertise yeah. to do that. Uh, there's there's a, another major worldwide company right now, 140 sites across the world, the center all comes into El Segundo, California. And uh, we're working with them because mysteriously they put in new Cisco switches and they upgraded firmware and their cameras started dropping off the line. So it, it's not an easy, I mean, this is what we and I as an individual, we as a company deal with day in and day out. It's not an easy situation, but the point is here, don't assume a data network works in these applications because probably 70% of the time it isn't. Don't assume because it's a brand name it's going to work. And don't assume that cheaper is better because it ain't. It's going to cost you more money. So um, that's the end of this presentation. I, Like I said, I will actually send out, if I have your names and emails, two other ones. Because I could go into all the great product we have and how the products we do it, but I'll point to this. Uh, this document over here defines product by method of transmission, coax, UTP, fiber. This document over here, which is on the internet, defines product by application. And if you click on the model number, not, not on the piece of paper, it's got to be on the computer, it'll take you to the spec sheet in the AE. Yeah, yeah. A couple, couple things have to take place here. So, um, Neil, thank you so very much for all your knowledge and, and information. And a couple of things are going to uh, take place. I know the booklet supply wants to make. Wait, wait, just one comment. You can email me your email address and everything else on here. Uh, to, and also, I'll point out that support at Vigitron.com is your best friend if you need anything. But you can email me, say that you went to this seminar, and I'll wait about a week or so, and then I'll compose the list and send out the presentations. So while, while we're still here, and before Neil goes, I want you to help me out with a little bit of what we, we do at Digitron. We, we went through all this technical information, which some may understand, some, some may say, I, I got some of it, but it's a lot of information to take into place. The thing to remember the most is that we're here for every single application. I got a call uh, one time for a one camera installation, then I get a call for 2,000 cameras. So even if it's just one camera, why is that important? Because it's particularly this one camera was in a high-end home that they had no power um, switch there. They said, well, how am I going to get the camera to record it? That's all I want to do is put it to that. So we have these little... POE, we want to call it an injector or POE source. Don't use the word injector. So, what, I know you don't have to put injector. So, what I created, what? and you're going to see. Injectors it, aren't standard. Yeah, let, let's make that point. Yeah. An injector does not follow the PSE 
guidelines for safety. So an injector is just a power source. The only way to stop it is it burns up or the camera burns up. A PSE follows the safety. Very important difference. Which is what we have as a PSE. So I gave him that part. He goes, wow, that really helps me. I never knew you had that. Because he's thinking of, well, I know that Vigitron has extenders. I know they make switches. But we make over 200 products. So while we were talking about how to get from point A to point B, when you look at the little, I made a cheat sheet because there's so much information. And this is not even touching, you know, half, one third of what we have to offer. And when you look at our little catalog, which I literally carry this in my bag because I'm always getting called, Peg, I have a situation. So if I open this up and you see not only the part number and description, but an actual picture of maybe one, two, or three different ways to use that product, that becomes important because now you're gonna say, oh, I see what we're doing. I have the camera, I have my extender, I can go this distance and so forth. How far can I go? I don't know. I'm gonna call Vigitron, or I'm gonna email Vigitron to say I have a camera, here's my link, tell me what I need. Let us do that for you. So when you look at this sheet, you're gonna see all these little pieces and parts. We have extenders to extend the IP source. We have extenders that are going to take the IP camera over the coax cable. We'll see that in the very, in the very beginning. We have devices, which I, I stress all the time, a little surge protector. Who needs a surge protector? Everybody needs a surge protector. Somebody will come to me and say, well, Peggy, I'm buying a high vision camera for 50 bucks. I'm not spending the money on a surge protector because I'll just get a new one. Well, five cameras later, because the, the, the building that they're in has is susceptible to, to, to surges, get one little, the smallest surge protector literally in the world. You pop this on the back of the Cat 5, you get outdoors, you want to put on the camera and the switch, or at the switch, dealer cost is about 21 bucks saves the integrity and the, and the actual product for you. It's IEC 61000 certified dash 3, 4, and 5 for 15 kV in free space, 8 kV contact and ground. You could also strap a grounding strap on it. It goes, it's not evasive. You can go in the port of a switch or back of the camera or both of them. The most important thing, and all the specs that he just said, so I wouldn't know even how to repeat that. This <laughs> is what <both. laughs> <laughs> wouldn't even try. I'm just, saying, I, I'm just saying we don't make up the specs, we certify them. So. That's what that all meant. That's it. It's going to protect your system. <laughs> One day I'm going to grow up and, 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 and talk like Neil. So we have these here at Brooklyn Supply. We're going to actually start stocking these here. We're going to have them on the counters for you. We're going to have everything that you need, including some uh, test tools. I, I don't have the one that I wanted to show you that has an LED display. Neil, if you have one, this to you, the dealer, is about 12 bucks to put onto your network to take, to take a look at what your Cat5 is doing. This one is a little bit more money, has an LED display. This one is the only meter of its type that reads out real-time voltage and wattage. No. Why voltage? The detection pulse. It's got a, a monitoring port. In fact, they both have monitoring ports. But uh, <clears throat> this one, if it doesn't light up, you ain't got enough power. If it lights up, it'll tell you the range of power that you're operating with. Maybe it's marginal. Every truck but, should have this. I mean, you don't need one for every single person. It would be nice, but you need one on the truck when they're going out into the field or one in your tool case. Surge you don't protection. Need it, with the PC. it works independently. Is that a PC also as well, right? It's got to work. It's in line. It works in full circuit. But no, you don't need it. I can just use it in, just on the ladder. Whatever. Where, where yeah. would you connect it? By the camera? Oh. So if you have yes, yeah, so you can do it yeah. from it's the camera line. through the cat uh, to the yeah. switch. So what else does it detect? It gives me voltage, watts, and basically. Any shorts? No. Well, if it's shorts, it will be zero. It will be zero. Yeah, I'll see right if anything is wrong. No. So when you're looking at... What is it running? Yeah, that one's about... Uh, dealer is 80? No, dealer is... Uh, dealer is about 72. 72. About 72 bucks. What is this so one this, this is a special. We're doing this. This one just gives you LEDs, but it also. And I have pizza fire. coming too. Uh, so you know. This is uh, a special for dealers. Uh, 12.95.
What does it do? It just, it just it? indicates LED lights. It just indicates presence. Presence. Another one okay. the actual voltage. But look. It's about 1295. You can't really say what the other cell is. Yeah, that's the high yeah. So back to this. So when you when, look at this what particular the sheet, you're going to see what will the all the parts and pieces. I'm going to tell you the amount. I'll tell you. Now, a couple of other things. Power. Here's my little IP. It has a You're going to have one at each end. But if you have 16 cameras outside, you're going to have 16 of these on the camera. You're going to have 16 port right before you switch. So you have the same thing for coax. You're going to have an IP camera. You have the IP camera plugged into here. You're going to go over your coax to your distance. At the other end, we have a 4, 8, and 16 channel receiver there that's going to go into your switch, which goes into the MVR. How long can that cable be? You're going to call us up and you're going to say, here's the part number of my camera, so we know what the POV watt's got to be. How long is your cable? We'll tell you what's going to work. And that's the best thing that you can do is always call us for those products. Here is another little piece where we an actual PSE where you can have power that can power up the camera. If you don't have a switch, we could use something like this. We have outdoor um, hardened switches for you. And it's just a box that has um, because the uh, uh, some other companies have extenders. So I, I tend to do a lot of underground work and manholes and stuff like that using Cast6A. You can use in veracity. So you have. You want me to tell you what's wrong? <laughs> uh, but, well, I'm talking about your water. Well, let, let me. Let, all right. Let me. Great point. Wait. Got to. Got to bring this up because we just got the order for an entire state because of what you just said. Mm -hmm. Our weatherproof products are built from the ground up. They're not products that are put in a casing. They are IP67, which means not only dustproof but they operate in one meter, three feet of water. Okay, we state that. Some of our competitors, we're not going to mention Veracity, he did, I didn't. <laughs> On their spec, they say outdoor. What, what does outdoor mean? Okay, how do you warranty outdoor? Yeah, they can go outdoor. So, um, ours are specifically certified, and not only that, they're now certified for salt certification too, for erosion. Salt. So there's a specific salt certification. They're, mm -hmm. So they're salt certified, they're IP67 certified, and we just went over an entire state that's converting because of the difference. Of if you look on page eight, you're going to see the, the high position, the hardest switches that we have there. On page uh, 18 is the single sources where you may need to have a drop and insert. You have the PTZ outside. This is what we're going to start putting in here. So this, everything that you need to know is in here. I can't tell you how important this came to me because after all that's said, at the end of the day, when you have an opportunity or an application and you look into here and it has all the applications in pictures for you, my God, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. Or here's an opportunity that I lost because I didn't know about the product. And as you go into here, we have families of product. We don't just make one. We make families, whether it's more ports, whether it's different uh, 10 gig, 1 gig, 100 base. You know, we have different products for different price points, for fiber, for UTP, for coax. So when you look into this book, really take a good time to say, wow, never knew I can fix the problem, which is something for under a hundred bucks sometimes. And keep in mind about our managed products and our philosophy of how they're built because you won't find this anyplace else. Connect reliably the first time, which means we monitor the connection and we'll do a reconnect, maintain the connection and monitor it on an individual port basis. If the connection goes down, automatically reconnect without a service call, tell somebody something has happened. That's embedded in all of our products. I have a question, and Peggy's familiar with the situation that I have. Uh, all of your equipment is backwards compatible, and when I say backwards compatible, where we have a device where it actually does 10 uh, megabits, uh, and I'm talking about the, uh, yep. the converter, yep. which you're aware of, because mm -hmm. um, we have a situation where site, um, all of the switches are high-end switches, but none of them will go down to 10 megabits. And yes, all, all of the all 10 gig guys, I have the 10 gig switch. Yeah, the answer. All of our switches 
are depending upon the rate that we have three classifications of switches. We have node switches, enterprise switches. I have a whole presentation for the fourth party, and we have core switches. In the in those levels, they're ten one they're ten one hundred or ten one hundred one G. Um, also, that we didn't go over specific product. Keep in mind, especially for guys who do um, higher end, where you have a situation. A lot of times with rack space, they want to save rack space. What I was saying that every time we do an application, that we give you a design, we're going to give you a design based upon budget. It could be a design based upon rack space. The one but based upon rack space may use one of our hybrid switches. What does that mean? I have a hybrid switch. Inside that switch, I have built-in extenders for either 8 or 16 coax or 8 or 16 IP. I have a fiber hybrid with PoE and fiber in it. And the reason why I mention that is because I have a very large end user where the integrator came up to me and said, can you design something? We gave him three choices. His choice for the cost of the rack was to go with the hybrid solution because he didn't want to go out and spend another thousands of dollars on a new rack. So there's always going to be different applications and different opportunities that maintain different it's solutions, yeah. which we have. Yeah. So remember the hybrid solutions as well that we have. Other than that, again, well, it comes One other thing, we're very, um, like I, we, we touched on security within the switch itself. Um, our enterprise level switches can monitor a single switch, a single IP address, can monitor up to 862 ports, 36 switches on the same network but it's forward with fixed IP addresses. So it routes just like the layer three, it crosses subnets just like the layer three, but you can't hack it. Our new fiber core switch does the same thing. We have, it's a 24 port fiber core switch. It's incredibly low price, has a built-in redundant power supply, all this kind of good stuff, but it contains 24 individual routers, fixed IP address, again, you can't hack it. Our new node switches are the first switches in the industry that have built-in anti-ghosting software. Ghosting, in case you don't know what the term is, obviously you program in an IP address. Your MAC address, machine address code, is fixed. Every single device, including your cell phones, has a fixed MAC address. But smart people can ghost it, pretend it's that device, and then hack it. We have the first switches out that have total anti-ghosting protection. And that's important for, for us, for that Mr. IT guy. So you know you, you know the IT guy who says, I will not put anything on my, my network. Yeah, that doesn't mean, yeah, I know you are. So that's why I mentioned to him on the way here that you were going to be here. Yes. Because specifically for that guy, what? we need to take it's him it's and give him the information, get him on the phone because he's not going to believe us. But we have to be able to get that switch on there to fix that problem. No, I, got, I got just a single, I have an elevator that I'm changing the camera. One right, is that the uh, cord is bad, I can't get to the well, source. So I think I'm using the power line over the way in the past. Most, a lot of the power the power line itself? Itself? No, I have two lines. I have two lines. Eighteen gauge wires. Two pairs, seven years ago. One is bad. The cord is actually somewhere there. The cord is somewhere there. I want a single so work there. I want to thank everybody. For Can coming. I make it work for uh, I appreciate single it. there? I appreciate everybody coming. Uh, I've been to this course two or three times now. Mm -hmm. Every time I learned a lot from him. So it's well. I think it was well worth my time. Hope it went to you. I joined the Brooklyn. I'm a long time veteran. I guess you probably figured that out by now. But uh, the industry, uh, fire also. I'm here at Brooklyn Supply. I've gone. I'm based out of Brooklyn. Born and raised there. But uh, David added me onto the team to help. Uh, I handle public relations. Peter is our sales manager. Uh, and I pretty much am very involved with the industry, New York, New Jersey, <laughs> through the country. I represent New Jersey throughout the country. I'm international also, as you heard. So we're here to help you, Brooklyn Supply. Uh, licensing, uh, anything you, you might have a question about, especially fire and very versed security. I've been doing this for a long time. So David brought me on to help you. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. So please oh, utilize it. Uh, if you need my part, I'll give it to you. You can always reach Peter. Uh, uh, Peter I do go from office to office, so I'm not here all the time. But I'd love to help you in any way. Uh, 
Again, it's really appreciate you coming. I hope we uh, we did everything you needed here today. Can we pizza? <laughs> yeah, pizza can be here a little bit. I have a lot of okay, no, public, you can't leave. I don't have Peter. a power system for the camera. Uh, thank you everybody again for attending. I don't have a power for the camera. Those of you who are new, this is a possible to fly. John and Arnoux, I'd like to introduce you to some of our staff upstairs. Is it just this little device? No. No, no. This is for any of the 2400. One of these, any one, single camera. So these, the top two, right? You will need the 2400 as the camera. Uh, and the, the power source, and this will go to uh, 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 uh,